and welcome to the very last session of Global Sources Virtual Summit. I'm your host, Meghla Bhardwaj, and in this presentation or in this panel discussion, I should say, we're going to be talking about 2021. We've got a, a panel of experts, Amazon and e-commerce experts, and they're going to gaze into their crystal ball and tell us what they see. We've got one panelist who's trying to connect, uh, so we'll wait for him. But in the meantime, let's get introductions going. So we've got Bernie Thompson, Sharon Avon, Anthony Co-Francisco. So guys, let's do some introductions. Bernie, why don't you go first? Yeah, uh, so hi, I've been uh, on, selling on Amazon for over 10 years and um, I'm actually right here in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, you know, this is where I live and where the company is. Uh, you know, it's here, it's in the morning here at 6 a.m. So, shh, everybody be quiet. I don't want to wake Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and tell us about Pluggable. <laughs> well, yeah, so um, I, I have a large uh, electronics brand uh, that was largely built on Amazon. I mean, we, we intended to build an electronics company. It happened to be when we started in 2009 that, that Amazon was ascended. We kind of hitched our cart to that horse, which was a good choice, although, you know, the road is rocky. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and, and so I've been mentioned in the Amazon shareholder letter, have been writ written up in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, one of the founders of the Online Merchants Guild. Um, and uh, you know, because I'm close to Amazon here, you know, kind of often involved with Amazon things and, and kind of betas and going on site to, to give feedback to Amazon teams. So. Um, I'm, I, I, I promise not to be overly gentle to Amazon in my predictions for 2021. Luckily for Amazon, it's easy to predict good things uh, into the future, especially the short term future. Awesome. So we've got Ash here and uh, he is your fan. Hello, all. You have one of my favorite panelists on, Sharon. Hi, Ash. I love it. And Michaela Johnson is here. Awesome. So, yeah, we're going to start with the discussion now. Uh, we'll wait for Tim. Um, oh, no, first we have to do introductions. Okay, <laughs> sorry, it's late here. Let's continue with the introductions. Sharon, you go. <laughs> Hi, first of all, thank you, uh, Megla and Global Sources for having me on. Um, my name is Sharon Evan. I have been selling online since I was 15, and now I'm 32. We're do the math, and I've been selling on Amazon <laughs> since 2016, and somehow I ended up doing YouTube and stuff and um that's it that's that's me i sell yes, both on awesome. and off amazon because i'm going to be speaking a lot of off amazon as well so i i sell on and off amazon as well yes and check out sharon's youtube channel for sure really good very informational videos all right anthony Hey everybody my name is anthony cofrancesco i came from originally actually a corporate background um, I actually used to work for Amazon. I also won't be too gentle on Amazon either. <laughs> I don't think they deserve it. Um, but a couple of years ago, moved out to the Philippines to help scale a creative agency and helped a lot of sellers uh, with their product photography, graphic design, all around conversion optimization. And uh, we sold that business in September of 2019. And uh, since early 2020, I've been working with this great company called PicFu and really diving in again to the conversion optimization and helping uh, a lot of our bigger clients get as much value out of customer feedback as possible. Okay, awesome. Um, also, all of you guys watching, stick around until the end because we are giving away some cool prizes. PicFu is one of the sponsors of Global Sources Virtual Summit and they are giving away free polls. So we have um, up to 10 free polls each of them is worth $50. We're going to be giving them away. So stick around until the end of the show. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I want to go around and ask each of you to share your top five predictions for 2021, right? And then we can all have a discussion. So we'll go one by one and then we'll, we'll sort of, you know, Sharon and Anthony and Bernie, I mean, you, you feel free to jump in when another person is sharing their um, their predictions. And uh, then guys watching, if you have any questions for our panel, or if you want to add some comments, or if you have your own predictions, feel free to post them in the comments as well. So Payman's joined us. Good morning, guys. What's up, Anthony? Payman, you missed a few presentations in the morning, huh? You're late. <laughs> uh, Mohammed is here. Okay, super. So I'm going to start... Uh, I'm going to start with Bernie here. So Bernie, tell us, what do you see happening in 2021? Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to start easy here, uh, you know, which is uh, talking about the growth of Amazon. 
So in 2021, Amazon will continue their march of just eating the world's e-commerce. Um, you know, what uh, started uh, 20 years ago by Jeff with the concept of being the everything store in a lot of geographies is becoming the only store. Um, and uh, we'll talk, some of the other predictions, we'll, we'll talk about some of the other consequences that I'm anticipating because of that progression towards being the only store. Um, last quarter, Amazon had 37% growth year over year. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what's happening in the EU, but one of the interesting things about that is they're putting out some statistics, uh, more than 70% of shoppers in France and 80% in Germany last year bought something on Amazon in the last 12 months. So, you know, you, you've got, uh, and, and certainly in the U S those numbers are even higher. Um, in the U S the, uh, there's more families that have a, a relationship with Amazon through prime, uh, than the. Uh, use the U.S. Postal Service uh, on a regular ba basis for, for mailing stuff themselves. So, you know, it's just the, um, the, the amount that Amazon has kind of conquered the world and, and kind of like put itself in the middle of our lives, at least our lives for, for the sale and purchase of physical goods, um, is just amazing. And um, it's self-reinforcing. Amazon has a whole bunch of flywheels that they're spinning here that are self-reinforcing as they gain more market share. It gives them the power to gain additional market share. Um, and so in 2021, nothing is going to stop those massive forces and Amazon is going to keep gaining market share um, in pretty much every geography around the world other than China, where it's given up and India, um, where there's a significant amount of government resistance and also um, they just haven't you know, been able to put together a model, but pretty much everywhere else that they go in the world, um, Amazon is ascendant. So kind of, an, we'll, we'll start it easy here with, with number one prediction. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's keep going. What about number two? Oh, you, uh, okay. Um, well, number two, I, I think we, you know, which again is uh, maybe get a little surpri more surprising with each prediction, but you know, ads are going to continue to eat profits, and I and I mean that in two different ways. Number one, um, the cost of Amazon advertising uh, is going to continue to eat our profits as brands and sellers. Amazon, um, over the last uh, three or four years, has become largely a pay-to-play platform. Um, you know, try search yourself on Amazon. What you'll notice is on any normal size screen, unless you've got a nice 4K, you know, uh, screen, um, often all you see are ads. All Everything organic falls below the fold. Um, we're seeing for our selling accounts, the percent of our total sales uh, that are actually ad generated uh, keep going up each year. And the advertising business within Amazon uh, in the last few quarters has passed Amazon Web Services as the most profitable part of the business. We can't be 100% sure about that because Amazon being kind of coy and, and not breaking out its ad business in the same way it does AWS. But, ba but basically, if you look at the numbers, it's very likely that ads have already passed AWS as a top profit generator. So, um, you know, where Google 20 years ago said, don't be evil. And what they meant by that was, you know, rather than all these other kind of portals that charge for space, we're going to give, we're going to be good rather than evil. We're going to show people the things that are most relevant to them, worry about relevance to customers. Amazon instead with advertising has said, forget that, we're just going to make it pay to play. And, uh, and it's going to become a huge part of how Amazon uh, makes money. So that process is going to continue into 2021. Amazon is um, is investing massively uh, in different ad programs and ad platforms. I mean, if you are, I mean, we are a white hat seller. So advertising is basically our main mechanism to, to get products launched and, and to be successful. And so we're in there on every new ad type. And, and there's always exciting things going on where they are uh, enabling new ways to reach customers that are really effective. I mean, right, uh, I, I think earlier on you had uh, Ritu Java who runs PPC Ninja. She probably talked about a bunch of these things, but just to pick one, video ads are just a huge success story for us right now. Um, and so that's just going to keep happening where, where Amazon is investing so much here. That creates opportunities uh, to reach consumers that you didn't have before, but it is all paid to play. Sharon, what do you think about that? Do you, are, are you seeing that trend as well? 
Video ads? I mean, yes. No, video just ads. general pay to play oh. and, you know, ads I eating think... into profits. <laughs> um, yep. Well, yes and no. I'm, um, I get a very small amount of sales today from, from my PPC, but you know, I do a lot of coaching. So I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, and I really think it depends on the niche that you sell in. It really depends on what you do because I don't really care if I'm, you know, paying 10 K a month on PPC, if I'm making a hundred K a hundred thousand dollars a month, right. In in total, I don't really look at a cost. I look more at the total advertising cost of sales. Um, I agree with Bernie and I think Bernie, is like one of those huge, huge sellers that are in um, really big, really big niches where else I am in all categories, right, Bernie? You're in electronics and it's really, really yep. big. Where else I'm in, in very niche beauty brands and very niche baby brands of, of my own. And like I'm in a different, you know, Bernie's like up here and I'm like down here compared to Bernie. So on a smaller seller compared to Bernie's level, I would say that, I preach niching down. I preach going, you know, not everyone can be, most people can't be as big as Bernie. Um, not saying that in a bad way and, and, you know, but there are things that are more reachable and I really do focus on niching down. Um, and when you read really niching down and, and niches that aren't super saturated, not everything has to come from PPC, um, meaning I believe in mostly PPC because buyers intent and you know, they're going on Amazon to buy compared to outside of Amazon traffic. They're hot buyers, but I do believe that it depends on, on the niches that you're in. So if you're in, you know, selling tumblers, yeah, you probably need to, to pay a lot of money to be seen. But if you're selling something very, very niche that I can't think of something without giving away somebody's product. So if you're in a very niche, right? Like instead of going, for something really big, but focusing on a very specific buyer avatar, not always um, PPC wise, but I definitely agree with Bernie. I think that this year in general, Amazon PPC is, you know, on, on another level, right? Like I think a lot of good things have happened this year, for example, them adding negative um, product targeting and, and auto, which is like a huge thing. Making video ads um, available to other people and not, you know, just the really big sellers as well many many things ppc wise so i think that ppc has grown a lot i do think that ad spend for possibly the much bigger and saturated niches is very expensive but i do think that the smaller niches are not as bad i mean there's still bids out there of like 20 and 30 cents in some niches so it's not the end of the world but video ads amazon posts things like that i think um you know, Amazon posts is a big thing that happened this year. And I think that the more people like us that speak about it next year, everyone will be using it. Uh, one of my predictions that if I got away with Amazon posts in you know, the last seven or eight months uh, without really my competition seeing it, I think that, you know, that's something else that more and more sellers that are brand registered will be using over the next period of time. Right. So Sharon, like let's hear your top two now. So I'll, I'm just going around. Yeah. Um, so Sharon, go ahead. Top two. My top two. Um, I was just focusing on 2021 in general, in my yeah. opinion. I guess some of them are my hopes and not only my predictions. I hope that COVID in 2020 has woken people up not to put all their eggs in Amazon, meaning not to put all their eggs in one basket and sell outside of Amazon as well. And I do hope that people are not hoping to be Amazon sellers, but rather brand builders, where you may even start with Amazon and have been introduced to e-commerce e through Amazon, but you can't just depend on Amazon. There are a lot of people who lost everything this year when you know certain things on Amazon happened. Um, I think that, yeah, so I think number one, 2021, I hope and I predict that people will look into selling outside of Amazon as well, whether it be Shopify or, you know, not Wix, but other stores, but or mostly probably Shopify or just using other avenues. You know, the amount of people I've coached this year that have like a hardcore Etsy product as well, right? So many people selling like DIYs and things like that. I'm like, do you sell on Etsy as well? 
And they say no, and I'm like, what? <laughs> like, how can you not be selling in this one? Etsy, Amazon is not the only, like, Amazon's huge. But, I mean, I've been in e-commerce all of my adult life, and I only discovered Amazon four years ago, right? So I was, I was making money outside of Amazon before I discovered Amazon through e-commerce. So there are other things. Yes, Amazon's huge, but I think it's important to not put everything only in Amazon. That's my first. My second thing is also me hoping that more people that, you know, the, the average Joe focus on niching and not trying to focus on how we've all, not we, because I'm not part of it, but people are taught, you know, to go into a software and type in all the parameters and everyone finds the same products and then everyone launches the same products at the same time. And I hope people understand more about um, niching it down um, because yes, the demand has grown immensely this year, but so is the competition, right? People that laughed at me last year or the year before, the year before that, not understanding, oh, she just sells online, you know, are calling me up now, you know, and saying, hey, can you teach me more about Amazon, you know? So a lot of people are getting into Amazon this year and it's going next year, I think, will be more um, competition, like competitive. The demand will also grow and I think it's even more crucial now to focus on niching down. So I hope that people will focus on niching it down, meaning not trying to sell, you know, the, um, I can't think of it now, but like the big major stuff and rather focusing on a specific buyer avatar within that, right? So, yeah. So you mean like a category, like focusing on a specific no, so, category, would you say that? So, um, <laughs> the one thing that's coming to my head is something that I'm working on, so I'm not gonna say that, but. <laughs> Um, well, garlic you know, presses, right? I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give the example that I've given in the past, you know, which is now, it's not the best example. I'll just give the example now, uh, like a specific one of, you know, how um, everyone was selling, oh, you know what? No, actually, no. Okay. You know how I used it? <laughs> you know how I used in one of my presentations the Perry bottle, right? So there is, everyone was selling the portable bidets, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people were selling portable bidets. And then there were people who were smart enough to understand that apart from selling it as a portable bidet, you can focus on specifically women who have just given birth and sell it specifically to women, right? Mm. So niching it down, not trying to sell to everyone, trying to sell to a specific buyer avatar. So instead of trying to sell specifically, I don't know, puzzles, a specific puzzle made for three-year-olds that has unicorns on it, right? Instead of just the puzzle. So niching it down. That's my top two. Okay, awesome. Anthony. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I think biggest prediction overall, and we've already started to see this come true in 2020, it's going to, I think, be even bigger in 2021, is you're going to see a lot of really big money coming into e-commerce. And so this is coming in a few different avenues. Like number one is we're seeing huge amounts of money coming from legacy corporations. We've seen a lot of companies, at least in the United States, I know globally as well, go out of business. I like using Victoria's Secret as an example, because a lot of people say, well, Victoria's Secret didn't go out of business. And you're right, they didn't. They just closed like a few hundred stores. So I guarantee what is not happening in their corporate headquarters is they're just sitting there saying, oh, this is totally fine. We're not really worried about this. All of these legacy corporations are doubling down and they're looking at their e-commerce strategy. On top of that, we're seeing huge influx of money from private equity companies. So the big ones you guys know of are like Thrasio, Boosted Commerce, Perch just closed something around an $80 million uh, round of funding. And so you're going to see a lot more big money coming into the game. Now, for newer sellers, that shouldn't scare you off. And the reason why is this is because for new sellers, for the past like, you know, 10 years, five years on Amazon, major financial institutions didn't really understand the online business market. So they weren't really willing to lend money to online business owners. They didn't really think that FBA was a legitimate business strategy or they didn't think it was worth the risk to lend. And so I think what you're going to see as well is for smaller sellers, you're still going to be able to get skin in the game. And you're still going to be able to compete with some of these larger retailers. You're just going to have to put a little bit more of upfront risk on your end. So when I first started selling on Amazon and I would not recommend anyone doing this, people would go and get 0% interest credit cards. They'd be able to get a huge line of credit and then use that to fund their product launches. So banks are still gonna be able to lend the money, but it's gonna be at a much 
more reasonable rate of interest and potentially unlocking different funding as you hit different metrics, as you build up your brand, as you build up your inventory, and there's some collateral or there's something that the bank uh, can have to reduce risk on their end. So I think it's a big win overall for online business. As time goes on, major lending institutions are really going to see online business, FBA, e-commerce business models as something they're willing to take risk on. So I think it's a, a big win overall for the industry. The other thing I'll say I think is going to be a big trend for 2021 is coming around uh, really creative innovation on the Amazon platform and Amazon really testing different types of creative assets that are going to work. So we've already seen it this year with them opening up A-B testing options for things like A-plus content, starting to roll that out into different parts of the listing. Um, you've also seen they started to reduce some of the restrictions, whereas in the past, only brand registered sellers were allowed to do certain things. And so I think we're going to see that start to be rolled out across the platform because Amazon is realizing the more of an immersive experience we give to shoppers, it's going to lead to higher conversion rates. It's going to lead to better customer satisfaction. And Amazon is all about the customer experience. So I think in 2021, we're going to see that expanded even more. Rich content options. Right now, for example, the only people who are really allowed to use 360 degree images are people who are vendors or people who have a dedicated account manager. I think you're going to start to see Amazon as they're testing and figuring out what is giving a better buying experience, they're going to start opening this up to more sellers. We just saw Amazon expanded bullet points for some categories from five bullet points to 10 bullet points. And so Amazon isn't just doing this arbitrarily. They're testing these things. They're figuring out what's working. What do people actually like to see better? So I think you're going to see a lot more uh, ability for the individual seller to, to start testing what works for their own listings and their own products. Yeah. So Bernie, what do you think about Anthony's first prediction, like big money going into e-commerce? I mean, do you do you see that as a trend as well? And, you know, are you thinking of maybe, you know, buying some some other e-commerce businesses? Yeah, it's actually, we have actually thought about uh, buying some and, and it's it's always interesting, you know, because generally these businesses are very cash heavy. Uh, those the, you know, It is good that there is a lot of money available now generally in the economy. I mean, it's kind of weird around the world right now. Money is chasing opportunity more than anything. And that's even outside of the Amazon space. And that's a good thing because the, generally a, a successful e-commerce business is going to be very cash intensive because you've got to carry a lot of inventory in order to stay in stock. Um, and uh, and while maybe some of the supply chain lead times are better than they were kind of historically 10 or 20 years ago, like this year is a, a great case in point. I mean, this year supply chain lead times stretched out dramatically, which basically for my businesses caused an enormous amount of cash to get consumed. And so we've had to scramble, um, you know, in the financing side to to have the cash to be able to stay in stock when thing, you know, lead times that used to be three months turned into six months and six months turned into nine months when you count um, you know, total supply chain time. Um, there definitely are a lot of big investment firms um, that are out there with funds. Um, you know, Thrasio has been getting the attention lately, but there's actually a bunch of other funds that started a few years ago. Generally, those funds have been slow to invest. I mean, I, I think we've talked to a few of them and they're looking for the kind of metrics and, and scale that are hard to find in combination. You know, I think what some of uh, what uh, Sharon was talking about in terms of niching is great. That's a great way to get started. It's a great way a lot of times to have a supplemental stream of income. Um, it's usually not, a, unless you're very fortunate and very smart, it's usually not a way to build a corporation, you know, where you have many employees and, and have a very large systematic business, um, you know, kind of by definition as you're niching. So these investment companies, they're looking for scale and profitability, uh, and that is a rare bird in e-commerce. Um, you, you can find them, and they are, but a lot of times they raise these funds and are actually slow to invest them um, because they have trouble finding uh, businesses that meet their metrics. Fantastic. So we have six uh, predictions so far, and all of them are really, um, you know, very different. I was thinking there that might be some overlap, but yeah, it's it's interesting to see that all of you have different um, kind of predictions. Okay, so let's uh, take some questions over here and see if there are any comments. So Shahzad has a question: What is the future of FBM? Because Amazon is pushing hard to FBA. Uh, many of my products, Amazon has restricted me only to go for FBA. Hmm. Is it? I thought it was the yeah. opposite, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I hadn't I hadn't heard about that restricting to FBA, but I could imagine it. Yeah. I mean, 
you know, years ago, they were really pushing hard for FBA and there really wasn't an alternative. Uh, this mm -hmm. year, uh, you know, Amazon really fundamentally shifted the buy box algorithm to actually at some points this year in the United States to really favor FBM. Um, and certainly when FBA was entirely disrupted uh, early in the summer, kind of at the start of COVID, um, you know, Amazon was quite desperate to, you know, since diversify fulfillment methods and, and uh, be kind of make a bunch of things easier, including the buy box on uh, sellers who were doing FBM. Now, um, maybe he's referring to kind of some of the seller fulfilled prime programs and other things like that, where Amazon over the last few years has said to some sellers, well, we're going to let you really participate in the Amazon warehouse network. And we're um, as long as you meet our metrics, we're going to give uh, I order ship by you the prime badge. And there were two at least two different programs that did that seller fulfilled prime and I'm forgetting the name of the other one. But um, they've largely shut those programs down because what they found was uh, well, and, and this actually relates to one of my later predictions. Amazon's actually very, uh, ha has a lot of hangups about policing their seller community. And basically when they police their seller community in the normal way, which is basically to, to kind of let you do your thing, not give you a lot of guidance, but then suspend you if any metric, you know, if any metric goes sideways in any way, they were basically finding they were suspending their seller fulfilled prime, uh, partners all the time. And so, you know, they've really scaled back the program. But, um, you know, I think long term, Amazon would love to have a monopoly of fulfillment. Um, but in the short term this year, actually, they've given a lot of oxygen to a lot of third party fulfillment uh, providers this year because of the co uh, COVID disruption. Like, um, you know, our favorite in that space is a company called Deliver. Um, you know, they've done very well this year, massively expanded their capacity and their shipment volume. And ultimately, that's really, really good for the world, because if, if Amazon FBA is the only fulfillment network in the world, that's a, just one more you know, kind of monopoly card that Amazon holds. Right. So um, someone is saying, agreed, there are so many opportunities on platforms other than Amazon. What are other platforms that you would recommend that have a diverse customer base? Sharon, do you want to take this one? It depends on the products, depends on what you sell, you know, whether it's through your own Shopify store, whether it's through, you know, Etsy, um, if you can get onto Walmart, it, it really depends on, on your exact product and what you're selling. Um, there are many other avenues specifically. I know that um, in America, you know, it depends on the country that you sell in as well. Um, and also trying to get into specialty stores. And I just want to, I have to comment on what Bernie just said because niching down does not mean selling a product that no one wants, right? Like we sell in niches and we, we do pretty well. Like we do well over 2 million in revenue a year and not everyone, there's this amount of people that make the amount I'm sure that Bernie does and a lot of people that make the smaller amounts. I've had companies like Thracia reach out to us. They do look at the niche is, as well, as long as they're our best selling products. Yes, they need many, many, many things in place in order for them to actually go through with the sale. Um, but I don't agree that they don't look at the niche products because a niche product doesn't mean one that isn't a bestseller. Um, it's not a big electronical brands, but there's still brands that are well known with, you know, over 20, 30,000 followers outside active followers and, and things like that. So niching down and specifically focusing on a specific buyer avatar rather than trying to sell to everyone does not mean that companies like Thrasy or Upsell On, et cetera, won't be reaching out to you, um, in my experience. But anyway, selling outside of Amazon can mean many different things. Um, I think the things that are really more in reach for the average seller are things like um, Shopify and things like possibly getting into Walmart. Um, there are obviously, there's Etsy and it does depend on what you sell. Not every single product you can get on Etsy. But I'm surprised about the amount of people that sell products that, you know, for children, for kids, DIY products, even home decor products that really can be sold in places like that as well. So just knowing your niche, knowing your buyers, knowing where they are, wherever they are, that's where you should be. And, you know, people only think about big department stores like Walmart, Target, etc. But specialty stores are definitely places that if you can get into like 
me having a beauty brand, you know, getting into little salons in America and things like that, not only America, Canada, et cetera. And also expanding marketplaces. You know, my biggest mistake was not expanding marketplaces sooner, right? Like I wish I would have gotten into other marketplaces ages ago because that's one of the, in my opinion today, one of the fastest like ways to scale. So thinking outside the box and not putting everything in one place is uh, is the point of that yeah i think that's uh, great advice and in fact at the summit we had um you know so many different people talking about uh, selling beyond amazon so we had shopify and walmart and um selling on amazon globally so japan singapore um, india okay let's take a couple more questions and then we'll get back to your prediction so ian is asking the international supply chain is struggling with a significant decrease in capacity air and sea alongside congestion at ports and in warehouses on the one hand and increase in buyer demand on the other do you think the situation will equalize in 2021 or will it persist for longer in your opinion so who wants to take this bernie do you want to take this first and then sharon you can chime in as well yeah, yeah, no, there's been massive disruption this year. Uh, you know, the uh, COVID hit, um, you had a massive uh, demand spike in most of the Western countries in March and April. Uh, and at the same time, uh, supply was disrupted uh, in Asia, where most of the supply comes from. And so then that just caused these kind of shock waves and ripple effects through the summer. Um, here in August and September, uh, containers coming into the U.S. West Coast. Uh, we, uh, we basically we've hit the highest uh, trade imbalance uh, of the last uh, 15 years here in the United States. There's five containers coming in with goods for every one container going out. Um, so there's just all these, and, and we've experienced at kind of our level of ordering products that, that everything is shifted out in time. The, the factory shifted out in time, getting the, um, actually getting space for a container on a container ship is shifting out in time. Air, of course, has been hugely expensive and hugely constrained this year as everyone's struggling. So yeah, so the disruption this year has been massive. I, I think absolutely there's gonna be, uh, already there's a little bit of a return to normalization right now. Things are a lot better here sitting in November than they were even three months ago. And I think that process will continue. Um, you know, the only thing that's going to mess with that process is, um, you know, probably all the things happening, all the disruption happening with trade. You know, we've got Brexit coming up here uh, in a month and that for anybody who sells into Europe, that's going to cause this, you know, I mean, one simple way we look at it is uh, the number of shipments we do is going to double and the size of those shipments is going to be in half. And so we're going to have to use air more and that's going to cause you know, those sorts of problems. So there, there's, there are spot disruptions around the world, but largely it's going to be a normalization coming into 2021. Awesome. What do you think, Sharon? Um, one of my best friends is Rafael, you know, from Beauty Cargo. So I, I'm really well aware. And I, I know a lot more, like I'm, I don't live in the bubble of my products anymore and I know what's going on and it's insane. I do agree and I think that things are getting better. And the truth is that I don't think anyone, any one of us can answer this question because I said that things will get better and then it got worse. And then I said that things will get worse and they got better. And every time that, you know, something like that happens and it's not because I'm, you know, we can do the best we can with this crystal ball, but we don't know if there's going to be another major outbreak all over again or what's going to happen all over again. We've got Chinese New Year coming up. I can tell you that we have in the like I, in the last three or four months um, prepared ourselves more than what we would have, for example, last year. We've got enough stock to last us a lot longer than what we would usually prepare for just in case anything happens and all the crap that I already know is going to happen during Chinese New Year, etc. Do I think it's going to get better next year? I hope so. I hope it's not going to stay the same. You know, I hope it will get better, but who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? I've been in the second lockdown now, so I, I just don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's very unpredictable with the pandemic. It's, unpredictable. Yeah. it's unpredictable. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's keep okay. moving now. So <laughs> let's hear your um, number three and number four. So Bernie, do you want to go? Yeah. Two more. So, so the, the number three prediction is that uh, in the commodity space, so not, not in the niche spaces, but in the high volume commodity spaces, the Chinese brands are going to continue to eat market share. 
Um, you know, over the last five years, uh, Chinese brands, which, um, you know, there's some kind of unicorn brands out of China, like in my category, there's a company called Anchor, which is well known as a model of, of, of a Chinese brand. But, um, you know, they were just the, the, the front wave of really, um, basically uh, five or six years ago, uh, none of the factories that we use to produce product had their own brands on Amazon. Today, I can't think of a mainland China factory that does not either directly or kind of secretly with the same owner um, have one or more brands on Amazon. So we are we have been competing against our own factories for at least the last two or three years, and that trend is just continuing. Um, you know, Amazon's beginning to um, you know kind of have uh, company names and addresses uh, shown visibly for the first time. They they were kind of you know hiding that for a long time. And the, one of the first places that leaked before anybody had a chance to, you know, kind of game it at all was in the uh, Mexico and Canada marketplace. The, they, they kind of started showing the names there. And um, um, Mike Jackness and, and his, his group did, a, did an analysis of the Mexico market. And about 60% of the largest brands were Chinese brands, uh, Chinese companies, um, you know, that, uh, selling in, in Mexico. So a little bit of a weird, a little bit of a weird data point, but uh, the the numbers uh, that matches the numbers basically that the Europeans are seeing when they're doing the analysis there. So I think that number is just going to keep going up uh, in terms of the total uh, kind of unit and dollar ownership of Amazon. It's going to be continue. Uh, Chinese dominance is going to continue, probably grow to seventy or eighty percent. I think COVID has accelerated uh, the the growth of that dominance. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, to kind of to Sharon's point, it's really rough being in any kind of commodity category like like I'm in, um, and there there is a strong argument in favor of niching down because if you're you know going big uh, into commodity categories, you are competing against your own factories uh, on Amazon. Okay, number four. On uh, the number four, okay, so. Uh, you know, we've, we've been talking about all this kind of growth of Amazon. Well, does that, you know, kind of continue forever? Um, you know, 20, we've already seen here in, in 2019 and 2020, uh, governments realizing some of the effects of Amazon and, and, and this amazing dominance. I and mean, we've never had a company with uh, a single company with so much global impact. So it started with some of the, you know, kind of side effects that Amazon had. Amazon has always been a, a kind of a tax avoiding company. Um, and a lot of the strategies they use are all around kind of, in a sense, taxes are not paid and, and uh, customers get lower prices because of that. And so the initial uh, kind of attacks on that were governments uh, passing these marketplace facilitator laws that, uh, in the U.S. states. Uh, that's now in at least 30 of the, of the 45 states that have sales tax. In Europe, uh, they're talking about marketplace facilitator laws, putting Amazon on the hook to collect and remit indirect taxes. Uh, I think UK is going to go first on that and, and in, in 2021 here, and um, the rest of Europe will probably fall close behind. But you just saw yesterday what, uh, what I would predict is the other trend for 2021 is going beyond tax. Governments are going to be looking at the dominance of Amazon um, and taking some actions. So yesterday, the European Union announced uh, that they were, you know, looking closely at how Amazon had tied together its marketplace and its own brands, and was using data from the marketplace in order to guide, um, you know, what products and what categories Amazon went into with its own brands, like Amazon Basics. Um, so these sorts of, you know, various kinds of antitrust uh, investigations by governments at all levels around the world. Uh, are really going to accelerate in 2021, and you're going to. I think 2021 will be a year where Amazon is trying to fight back all of those efforts and and resist them. Um, but the pattern here is that Amazon, you know, kind of gains the system and then resists enforcement, but eventually, you know, kind of acknowledges and it embraces uh, the new, you know, the, the new worlds that the governments, uh, you know, kind of lay out. And so maybe that's my, my super early 2022 prediction is that Amazon actually embraces some of these efforts like separating its marketplace from its brands, for example. But 2021 will be the year of enforcement. Okay. Uh, Michaela is saying, it is astounding the number of Chinese sellers are on, on Amazon when I do my product research. I kind of feel hopeless at times. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Sharon's not wrong in knocking me. I'm kind of an idiot for being in a in a big, uh, you know, commodity category. No, you're not an idiot. You're not an idiot at all. Just, first of all, you started you started earlier. I'm guessing than than most, and I just think that, you know, I I think that for some people, your company is out of reach. Most, I think for most people, your level is out of reach and my level is not out of reach. Most people watching us can get to my level. It is not that not that hard to get to a million dollars in revenue. Although revenue means nothing, right? It honestly, it doesn't. Profits is everything. Of course, there are, it doesn't matter how much you make in revenue, but I think that I'm a lot more in reach for, for most of the people, not most, I don't know who's watching us, but I think for many other people. And I don't want people to think that niching it down is not the right thing to do because I do believe it's the opposite and exactly also because of what you just said. Chinese sellers coming in and who was it that said that? Michaela, was that her name? Yeah. Don't don't get discouraged because, you know, I the Chinese are best at copy pasting. That's the best of what they do. They copy, they see something and they copy. They don't think outside the box the way that we do. And well, not we, I mean, the way I do, I don't know about everyone, but I think outside the box, right? Like pick through is, is, is like, I'm on pick through all the freaking time, right? And trying to really understand my buyer avatar and really trying to get in dig deep into who am I selling to, right? And then where are they? I get into Facebook groups of my buyer avatars and I understand if I want to bring out um, a nurse supply, um, a nurse supply brand, right? I want to supply, so did you guys know that nurses in America have to supply all their own stuff? Stetoscope, their stetoscope cases, everything, all of their things they have to supply themselves, their scrubs, their everything they have to supply themselves, right? How did I know this from doing product research, right? I started with careers and I started niching it down and I found nurses and then I realized that I don't know anything about nurses, so I got into heaps of nurses Facebook groups, right? Heaps and heaps of nurse Facebook groups. And then I realized that, oh my God, they have to pay for all these things. And then I started looking really deep into it. Everyone was Chinese sellers selling stethoscope cases and this and that. And my little brain that isn't that little starts thinking, okay, let's get into Pinterest. Let's get into Etsy. Let's, let, let's ask them, what do you guys want? It's just thinking outside the box. It, and it's not only Amazon, right? Amazon's not the only place. There are many other places that you can sell that to. But what I'm talking about is in reach, you just have to think differently. And not everyone has a huge amount of cash flows, right? Like not everyone has $100,000 to start Amazon and you need money, you do. You have to have money, you need cash flow. But, you know, it's, don't get discouraged is what I wanted to say to Michaela. Keep going, just think outside the box. Watch my YouTube channel, it'll help you. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the next thing? Cause I could ramble on about products and niching that all the time. What right. So, um, so Sharon, tell us about your number three and number four. Then we go to you, Anthony. Again, it's predictions with hope. <laughs> um, I predict and I hope that more people will look at Pinterest. So I hope that more people that are looking at, um, and I predict that the people that aren't trying to sell, you know, the copy pasted products or not just copy paste, but the really big products um, will start to think outside the box and to start use things like Pinterest, like Pinterest advertising and using things like Pinterest and working with influencers. When you're building a brand, if you're just an Amazon seller, meaning all you do is sell random products on Amazon, what I'm telling you probably isn't going to help. But if you know who your buyer avatar is and you're consistently bringing out more products to them, Amazon advertising, which I preach, and Megla, I'm sure you know how many PPC videos I have, and I love PPC on Amazon. Outside of Amazon is also great, right? So I hope and I predict that people will start thinking outside the box, not just with softwares all day long. I love softwares for certain things, but thinking outside the box and using not only the softwares to do their product research, um, and start using things like Pinterest, getting into Facebook groups of your buyer avatars, you know, Etsy, et cetera. Um, that's my hope and my prediction, if I have anything to do with it anyway. That was number one. <laughs> that was number three. Number three. And my number four is that I do think that people now, especially, will be more open-minded to sourcing outside of China as well. 
not every single product in this world can be sourced outside of China on, you know, mass production wise. But I mean, one of my beauty brands uh, is the, the factory that makes our products is in Poland, right? So I do think that this is the year that if your product is not a must to be made in China, there are many other places like, and I'm sure that this is the summit for you guys for that, like India and Vietnam and Korea and many other places, Mexico, right? The Middle East, there are many other places that, um, and I think that now people are more open-minded to it where else maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago, everyone just wanted cheap. And today with the, you know, the, um, the whole source and the whole logistics from getting products from China to America now in general with the tariffs, I think people are more open-minded to it. So I hope that people that don't necessarily have to, and again, not all products, electronics, toys, etc., don't go out of China. But there are many other products that can be made out of China, and I think that people in 2021 will be more open-minded to it. That's me. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a good one, and I agree. <laughs> Um, all right, Anthony, let's hear your number three and number four. Sure, sure. So I guess along the vein of, of which products to sell, niching down, I really do like the, the topic of this conversation. And so I think it's pretty clear that in, in 2021, if you're trying to sell a Me Too product, I mean, I think Me Too products have been dead for a while. Um, even things like traditional product research is becoming very, very difficult because everyone's using these same tools, it's gonna to be hard to find a product there. And so I think we're moving from the, the standpoint on selling on Amazon, where we're actually going from, you, could, you can't sell a Me Too product, going from actually innovation to invention to something that's actually brand new, that's solving a specific problem that really hasn't been done before. Um, and those are the products that are really gonna do well, uh, just because a lot of, unless, unless you have some, some cash behind you or you've got a really good team, it's going to be hard to even stand out and innovate, of, innovate a product in a similar way. Um, so the other tip, I guess, would really go into, we talked a little bit about an off Amazon strategy. And so one component of that is the marketplace itself. So selling on marketplaces aside from Amazon. For some products, the customization that you have through something like a Shopify store, just in the way that you're able to send your message about what the product is, what it does, maybe being able to bundle different uh, things in your storefront together. For, for some products, an off Amazon storefront is just gonna be a better buying experience. And it's something that Amazon, like imagine if you're trying to sell a furniture item, you know, Amazon doesn't let you do augmented reality placements of that furniture product, but Shopify makes that very easy with their plugins. And so for certain things like clothing items, uh, my roommate from the Philippines actually just launched uh, a shoe brand earlier this year. And I remember we were actually at Global Sources less than two years ago and we we're saying, do not launch a fashion brand. You can't do it. Like it just doesn't work. But he was very smart and he saw the vision long term that his product solved a very specific problem for a very specific niche. And now the product is doing well, but it does not do well on Amazon, right? Not only because fulfillment fees are so high, but it just doesn't have the volume in terms of search intent. You're never going to find that in terms of a keyword research because it's a brand new product invention. The other thing to keep in mind about your off Amazon strategy is think about off Amazon traffic flow, right? PPC, think about how much money you're dedicating in terms of PPC on Amazon and start to think about if you would reallocate those to other traffic sources. So I hear a lot of people in certain categories uh, that are having success with things like TikTok, with, with, with Twitch, which a lot of people might not even realize gets much more combined view time than all of YouTube. Um, and so looking at some of those off Amazon traffic sources as well, especially in terms of video, especially in terms of uh, micro influencer collaborations, there's really a lot of potential out there. And I think as Bernie was saying earlier, if we do see a world in which Amazon has to adapt to a different regulatory environment that other marketplaces and other you know, opportunities are gonna quickly pop up. And you gotta realize that anytime there's a change in this industry, that market share, it's not just going to evaporate. It's just going to switch to something else. And so I would always have my eyes on the horizon about seeing if something is going away, that means someone else is going to come in and snatch that up. So just keep your eyes open. Yeah, totally makes sense. Okay, let's uh, take some product, uh, some questions over here. So, um, okay, Mikaela is asking, Sharon, thank you. This is slightly off topic. How do you judge if a product is doing well on Etsy? Do you have a specific metric? I work it a little bit differently. It's not that I look for products on Etsy or how well they sell on Etsy because Etsy buyers and Amazon buyers aren't necessarily the same buyers and it depends on what you're selling. 
Um, I saw Ash, which is a good friend of mine, just wrote that there is a tool called Allura, A-L-U-R-A. I haven't used that tool. First of all, you can look at the best sellers. That's number one. But number two, even if a product is selling really well on Etsy, you have to go and check the keywords and make sure that people are actually looking for it on Amazon. So you can't just sell it on Etsy because it doesn't, because it sells on Etsy, because if no one's looking for it on Amazon, no one's going to find it. So you have to make sure that you can get discovered. Um, I will say, is it okay? Well, I'm going to say it, so it better be okay, that I do have <laughs> a full-on YouTube video on how to do product research using Etsy, and it's like it's free. I'm not selling you anything. So that's a good one to watch. Um, it's more about thinking outside the box. I find something on Etsy, and then I find, mm, how can I repurpose it and sell it on Amazon? Right, so I think I give an example there of. Um, actually, it's not it's not on YouTube, but it's it's something it's something I can use an example. So, a lot of people don't know, but funny products sell really well on Amazon. Like stuff that has funny sayings on it. I'm not mm. going to swear now, but either stuff with swear words, or I'm sure you guys know that there's one that says "nice butt" and you put it above your toilet and all sorts of funny things and. And they're actually best sellers on Amazon. I, I know people that sell products that are like day-to-day -day products that have a funny, you know, quote on it that sell a lot. Like they make a lot of money. So watering cans have search volume, I can't remember, like 500,000. I can't remember what, what their search frequency rank throughout the year is. It's something insane. People like to buy watering cans. But this is what I mean by niching it down. And on Etsy, I saw that someone was sell had a sign that there was heaps of reviews on, and it said something like, grow, damn it, right? Which is, which is funny, like, in their garden. And I was like, you know, what if you take, what if you take the grow, damn it quote, and you put it on a watering can, and you make it like a funny-looking watering can, and you package it in a way that it's a gift for a gardener? Now, that sounds great. It sounds awesome, but, like, you have to make sure that there is someone's going to actually buy that. So number one, you would ask on Pickford, you know, would you buy this? And you'd see what what your what what people have to say about that. But I use Etsy to think outside the box, not always as a starting point. So that's me answering Michaela. I could honestly talk about this all day, but I want to give other people the opportunity to speak. <laughs> so that's that's a really quick thing about Etsy. <laughs> awesome. I think also um, Marmalade is another one for Etsy. So that's, that's another tool that helps you see the top products. Okay, so let's see um, payments question. Any tips that you guys have on limiting your own Chinese factory competing against you? Bernie, do you want to take this one? Yeah, no, it, it's tough. I mean, you know, again, I'm in electronics, which is a really weird category because it's really driven to commoditization because of the um, there's, there's these economies of scale that you need. And so, in fact, uh, for a particular type of product, there's often only a few factories in the world that do certain types of products with electronics because they just they have to be good at them and, and so it makes it hard to limit information and, and do exc exclusives and stuff so there are you know if you if you have a lot of heft there are certain types of exclusivity um, that you can uh, get with your suppliers um, you know for example if you're willing to pay for uh, tooling, you know, to have at least a unique exterior to your product. That's a very common model. Um, you know, you're, you're going to be talking about a few tens of thousands of dollars, though, uh, to, to, you know, pay, pay the NRE, the non-recurring engineering cost of, of that uh, unique tooling. Um, and then ultimately, if another kind of big customer comes along, in most cases, and that customer says, well, basically, we want something that looks like that successful product over there. The factory will say, well, we can't do exactly that, but let me change these one, two, one or two small things and, yep, go at it then. So, so ultimately, you know, the, it, in some categories, it's kind of hard to get that. There was another question uh, about kind of uh, suggestions for manufacturers for minimizing sunk cost and, and another question about producing outside China. You know, for all three of these questions, there's a really great resource um, in the U.S. A, a guy, one of the guys who who uh, engineered the uh, Zumba, uh, you know, vacuum, uh, started a company called Dragon Innovation. And if you're into, you know, kind of mechanically intricate products or, or products with electronics, uh, Dragon Innovation has a has a great set of con content talking about exactly what you're asking about. How do I uh, do an innovative product? get it manufactured at a reasonable cost, 
but also protect myself. Like one of the strategies that Dragon Innovation will will talk about if you, and, and there's a lot, so I, I can't summarize it all perfectly, but is basically to split up the work on your product, actually have, you know, one factory, you know, do the PCB and have a totally different factory flash the firmware and have a totally different factory do the assembly so that you spread the knowledge, the, the knowledge of how to produce your products is not sitting at a single factory. Um, we've never uh, gotten to the scale, actually. I mean, we're, we're at a pretty big scale, but we've never gotten to the scale quite where that makes sense. I guess in a minor form, we've done a little bit of that. But, um, but I think if you're shooting for something big and unique, uh, there's some really great materials there that Dragon Innovation has in thinking through how to do that and protect yourself. Can I also pitch in on the non-electronical type of products? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, what was the exact question about limiting the, uh, protecting yourself? So he, but he said something about premium products. Now, I don't know what he means exactly by premium products, but first of all, if you're inventing a product, um, I'm sure you had either CJ or Yael or both, right? On um, Yael Kabili, did, was she on in, in the virtual? Yeah. Was she on? Yeah. Okay, so Yael or CJ getting a patent, um, either, you know, a patent or a design patent in China or in whatever country you mean to, to sell in um, is one thing and then they can do their best to try and compete against you. Of course, like getting an NNN, we all say it, but at least you really, no one really ends up, unless you're maybe on Bernie's level, um, going against the, the Chinese, you know, um, suppliers. I think that if you're making an invention or a, you know, we chose a specific sourcing company for a product that we had a, um, a patent design on, a design pattern on, and we chose this Chinese sourcing company because we wanted to have someone with a Chinese entity because we don't have one and we thought that they would, that would protect us. And at the end of the day, it didn't really protect us. I think that in China specifically, Bernie, maybe uh, you can pitch in on this, but I, I also we don't sell anything in electronicals or anything like that. And a lot of our products are products that at least the design of them we designed. I'm talking now of, of our beauty brands, uh, of our baby brands that, that we designed. Um, we have had people try and copy us, whether they were Chinese or not. And then we can't fight them in China, but we can fight them in America. Right, and we can fight them in other countries in Europe as well, but we can't really fight them in China. Um, and I just think that it's important to think about, it depends on what you're selling, obviously. I mean, if your company owns a patent, like I've got a, a client who her supplier owns the, pan, the patent on the product that she sells. And I personally think it's a little bit dangerous because they could do whatever the hell they want and decide tomorrow that you know she, they, they don't supply to her anymore and they want to do everything on Amazon. So it depends on the product, but there are things in place that you can do like getting, if you can't take care of yourself in China, then at least take care of yourself in the countries that you're selling to, because then when they sell it to the people, you know, they, the product that you've invented, they may sell it to somebody and they try to sell it in America. At least in America, you have the ability to take them down. I could have said that in a minute and somehow I always end up if speaking for so long. <laughs> Anthony, if, go for it. If I can just chime in real quick, this will be like 30 seconds, but the other thing is, if you're selling a product that's doing well, just expect that at some point, you know, this is just kind of, you can pat yourself on the back. This is, it's it's a thing that's just going to happen. So one of the things that's that Amazon really talks a lot about, which is good, is don't focus on competitors, focus on customers. And so just expect that if you sell something that's successful, other people are gonna try, and they're gonna try to come as close as they legally can uh, to making that work. And so what's gonna make your product stand out is what's the presentation of your brand Right? That's something that you can't copy and paste that into a mold. Um, what's the experience for the customer? And then once you've built out those assets, and this is things that your legal team will tell you, is once you've built out the way and the look and the feel of your brand, that is something that's protectable. And even with Amazon, the strides that they've been making in their IP accelerate or their, their IP protection programs, that's something that Amazon actually can protect you on. Even if uh, someone can make your exact same product, your brand is something that you can protect. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, so just Michelle, just to chime yeah. in there a little bit. Uh, absolutely, Amazon. It, we talked a lot about a lot of the negatives of Amazon, and and actually, this is interesting in this area because Amazon has flipped the U.S. intellectual property system on its head. It, it it 
largely is a system that where it takes a lot of resources to prove infringement. Um, but Amazon has changed that by allowing brand registered sellers to very easily uh, make IP claims against other products and have them be taken down. And, you know, um, sometimes that gets used to create kind of chaos and it's a tool for bad actors, but it can also be, you know, it's important to realize that's a really important tool for you as a brand. Um, you know, uh, trademarks are necessary to get to get into brand registry and they're also, you know, a tool. Um, uh, just something people don't think about in the U.S. a lot. Um, the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, I mean, part of what they do is they, they enforce trademarks. I mean, they are constantly scrutinizing product coming in a port. And when uh, that product is using known logo marks, they will actually check uh, th that are registered. They will actually check if it's valid product. Um, you know, we know this because we had a bunch of keyboards rejected because they had a, they had a Windows key on them with a Windows logo, and and so Customs and Border Patrol kind of asked us, "Hey, do you have, do you have rights from Microsoft to use that Windows logo?" Um, anyways, so that that's a mechanism. And then with brand registry, if you get a, a utility or a design patent, design patents are relatively inexpensive to get a few a few thousand dollars. Um, actually, the, the Chinese brands are aggressively getting design patents in the U.S. for all their products. A, a lot of them are kind of at war with each other using design patents, um, but they're relatively easy to get. And Amazon will, uh, you know, allow you to knock, uh, you know, copycat products off the market uh, with a design patent. And then utility patents are extremely powerful in the United States. Those are patents on the, the kind of method and apparatus for how something works, if you're into that kind of thing with your products. Um, and those can be quite broad. Uh, Amazon has an arbitration system now around, around those. But again, you know, if you can get a utility patent, um, you know, it, it, Amazon has actually made it easier to enforce that against, uh, against other people. And this is going to continue to be a big topic between governments, too. I mean, a lot of the trade tension between the U.S. and China has been focused on this issue of IP protection. I think almost too much so um, because it's a little bit of a red herring. But still, I think there's going to be a lot of activity in this area, kind of strengthening the ability for, um, you know, non-Chinese companies to, um, you know, kind of knock down copycats. Okay, let's take this question from Michelle. I think it's very interesting. So everyone talks about going outside of Amazon, but the reality is you have to uh, scarcify your time on Amazon for somewhere else. With the same amount of effort, do you really, oh, sacrifice, I guess. Do you really get more out of it? What well, do you guys think? So let, let me let me start with it. I want to end on a positive. So I'm going to start with the negative and then maybe somebody else can talk about the positive. So I'll talk about the positive. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so if you're in a commodity category, as I am, um, you know, it, it's actually tough. You know, we, we from day one, we've been eBay. Uh, we've done every marketplace as soon as it opened up. We've been on Walmart for five years. We're on Google Shopping. We've been there's a, a nice electronic specialty marketplace called Newegg that we've been on uh, since 2014. Um, the sum total of all of those other non-Amazon marketplaces, and, and we sell we sell all of our products on them. So kind of same products, same marketing, same everything. The sum total of all those other markets is less than two percent of, of our, and, and Amazon is ninety eight percent. Wow. So there are some categories where your ability to diversify away from Amazon is just dismal and you just got to know what category you're in and what kind of product it is because that's not true of everywhere there's there's other categories that amazon's a terrible is the is is the is a much smaller market share like take uh anthony i think used the example of furniture um you know that's a market where you know you don't want to be amazon first on furniture uh, at least most types of furniture so um yeah so maybe maybe uh, sharon and anthony can jump in on you know kind of some of the different category stories as it relates to this question i think that look everything's product dependent right bernie and i live and and breathe amazon very differently because he sells electronics and it is at scale at a huge amounts and you know i i think to some people i'm a big seller and next to him i feel like a really small seller you know and it and it's fine i'm not it's not a competition. What I'm saying is that it depends on what you sell. It depends on whether you're trying to be an Amazon seller or whether you're trying to be a brand builder. And if you're trying to be a brand builder and your product makes sense outside of Amazon, you should be outside of Amazon. And does it take time? It takes time. But are you running a business or are you playing a game? That's my opinion. I'm running businesses. This is what I do. 
right? I mean, I it took yes, I do Amazon and I mean, I do YouTube and other things, but I have I have other people on my team, etc. But what I'm saying is, I didn't sleep for probably the first two years when I started my businesses, right? I I I, I had I just gave birth and I was very you know, I was working really, really hard, and it's just the sacrifices that, that you make. I was reaching out to every single beauty um, influencer on in, on Instagram and in other places at the time, et cetera, and I was giving out, you know, free things for them just to try these products, and I went into all the Facebook groups of mothers, and I did many, many things, and I worked really, really hard, but it got me to where I am today. I don't send any outside traffic to Amazon. Why would I send my outside traffic to Amazon? I send all of my outside traffic to my online stores. So I think it depends on what you're selling. I think it depends on whether you're brand building and if your brand makes sense outside of Amazon as well. If you're, you know, it makes sense that if you're selling big electronic products, then yeah, electronics is huge on Amazon. Not that beauty isn't, right? Like I was heavily attacked on Prime Day and had some of my listings taken down because we have some best sellers and beauty is ruthless. Probably not as much as electronics, but it's also <laughs> ruthless. And um, and I just really think that it really depends on on what you sell. And I think that you know, businesses it's hard. And if you want to scale, and you want to scale not just on Amazon, meaning if tomorrow Amazon decides to take down your brand or that you can't sell anymore, and that was your only stream of income. You know, when Amazon took down our, we had paid. I don't know if like any of you, none of you probably really know this, but we on Prime Day, we had one of our beauty brands fully attacked and I'm not going to get into it because I'm over it now, but everything's back to normal now, but it took a month to get it back. And I've no doubt in my mind that it was an internal job. But anyway, and we had paid influencers to send people to a dog page on Amazon. So we had sent out and given different codes, et cetera, to influencers for them to send traffic, big influencers, to our pages. And when they went to our pages, it took them to a dog page because our products were taken down because there were like 250 something drug related keywords uploaded by someone did it internally. And it took me almost a month to get it back up. Thank God that my brands are also sold outside of Amazon. Thank God that I could pivot when I needed to and send them somewhere else. So again, it depends on what you sell and it depends on, on your, you know, where you're trying to go. And I think that um, it's hard work, but it's part of the business, in my opinion, in my experience. Great. Okay, so let's keep going over here with our predictions. So we've got one more prediction from each of you. So Anthony, do you want to go with your last one first? Sure, sure. And, and I guess I'll leave on a, a positive note here as well. Kind of in response to that question and just overall for Amazon is, you know, Amazon is still a huge opportunity. Like Bernie said, it's for most things, it's the vast majority of all of the traffic in terms of e-commerce, especially in the United States and even outside of the United States. And so a big thing is, you know, just take a deep breath, right? A lot of people, especially when you're just starting out, and I was very lucky when I started out that my business partner, Eric, was very good. He had been doing it much longer than me. It was like, things don't change that fast. They seem like they change fast and they seem like all of these things are coming at you. But in reality, even if I were to come here and drop the, the best tip that no one has ever heard of and drop it in everyone's face, it's gonna take months for people to really execute and for that to really start to play out and see how it works. And so when you're just starting out, the question I don't think is, unless you really have a, an, like a brand new invention of a product, it's probably gonna make sense for you to start on Amazon and then start building your off Amazon strategy once you've already validated on the largest platform for selling. And so just overall in terms of, you know, crystal ball tips for, for next year in 2021 and beyond is just, yeah, take a deep breath. And when, when you're selling, stick to what actually makes sense for the customer at the end of the day. Think about long term, where is your brand, where is your product going in the long term? And don't get so bogged down in the weeds by you're in all of these groups and you're following all these blogs and you're following these influencers and they're like, all of these things going on. Just just take a deep breath and just take it one day at a time. And if there is something catastrophic, I mean, Sharon just walked through something that would be catastrophic for many sellers, but I'm sure because she's been doing it quite a while, she was able to say, okay, 
let's let's take a deep breath. We're going to figure this out. And then within a period of time, the situation was rectified. She might have had some lost sales and she might have lost some money, but the brand's still there. And you have to look long term and don't get don't get, you know, in a negative position about every little thing. Otherwise, this business will just and I had this problem when I first started. It'll just be exhausting and you'll get worn out and you won't be in it for the long term. So good luck, everyone. And you know, anything, it's just, just get used to change, right? That's just what's going to happen in this industry. And if you can kind of put that in your, in your mind, that this is just the only constant is that there will be change. You're going to do just fine. Fantastic. You need resilience. <laughs> you need resilience when you sell yeah, it. I think we've, all of us have uh, learned how to be resilient in 2020, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bernie, what's your last one? Okay, well, you know, um, am I allowed to go out more than one year? Am I allowed to go out 10 years? Yes, absolutely. Go for it. Um, so so here's, here's my prediction. You know, the, the world's manufacturing has sloshed to one country, largely China, over the last 30 years. Um, and over the last 10 years, the world's e-commerce has sloshed largely to one company, Amazon. Um, 10 years from now, my prediction is that uh, manufacturing will be more spread out around the world than it is today, and that Amazon will not be the only store and or maybe even the dominant store uh, all around the world. So, so kind of going to everybody's points here, sometimes you need to zig when other people are zagging, and especially when you're getting started. You know, like when I'm starting something, I'm looking for a way I can think different and find a few stars to align where I'm doing not the same thing as every, everybody else, but actually I'm doing a few smart things that are different. That'll just let me get off the ground, you know, with, with a, you know, in a sense, you know, with a niche, uh, a, a niche of value that I can deliver to the world. And, you know, if you're looking forward to that world, um, you know, where uh, it's not quite so concentrated the way we've gotten here in 2020, um, you know, and you're building a company for the next 10 years, um, you know, I think thinking differently is the way to go. And I think the people who are thinking differently here in 2020 are going to be the ones that have some surprisingly big and successful businesses in 2030. That is great advice. Look forward to 2030. All right, Sharon, <laughs> what's your big one? So when we started, I knew that there were so many of us. I only wrote down four and I was like, I'll just go with the flow because I'm always <laughs> someone who goes with the flow. But I do have something to, to say about something that Anthony said and, and that, that I, I have to put my two cents on it because it's important for inventors. So he said that if you're an inventor, a product that Amazon's probably the place, you know, to, 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 um, to launch it on. So, sorry, have, not, not if you're inventing, probably not because you won't have the search okay. volume to. Because that's what you said. And I was, I was just about to say, you have to be careful with that because there's a lot of people that invent amazing products and Amazon's the worst place in the world and the last place in the world that they should be launching their products on because I'm totally against the, the when people say we don't sell products, we sell keywords. I'm against that 100%. I hate it when Bradley Sutton says that. I love him, but I hate that. And I was waiting to tell Jim Jordan that I hate when he says that as well, but he ended up not being here. But anyway... Um, cause we don't, we sell to people and we sell products and we need to find the right keywords and find the gap in the markets. But anyway, I just wanted to say that about, um, about that. And to, what, what else do I predict? You know, I don't have another prediction right now. I predict that it's going to get crazy and I predict that it's going to get even harder. And I think that people need to be prepared. I can tell you that even myself as I'm not as experienced as Bernie, but I'm, experienced enough to say this i felt like i had seen a lot of things i'm extremely well connected in the industry and um even when this happened to me when you know almost and well not an entire brand but a lot of products from one brand were taken down and like that in a second for for a long amount of time i there was a lot of swearing involved and i was very very moody <laughs> for a few days but the thing is that and what I have learned, it does depend on who you know, but everything- I saw your post in your in your group. <laughs> I have to admit, I wasn't very patient for that, that month, that I wasn't the nicest person, but I knew that everything was figure outable. Like, and I keep saying this and it's true. Everything is figure outable. You just need to find the way to, 
to figure it out. And also you need to know the right people, but it's important to know that it's, it's not easy and it's not, you know, it's not fairy tale and unicorns and it's all, oh, you just find a product, put it on Amazon, you're going to be a millionaire. It's not like that. Never was like that. Well, maybe years ago, but it's not like that. So yeah, just be resilient and know that everything is figure outable. Stay well connected. Being in too many Facebook groups is not a good idea because it, there's so much bad information in there. But be well connected. Watch these summits, and um, you know, and that's it. All I have to say is just be be strong. <laughs> be strong. It's not as easy as it looks, but it, everything, honestly, everything's figure outable. Even when bad things happen to you on Amazon. Absolutely. Um, that is fantastic. So we have a long list of uh, predictions from all of you. We would have had five more from Tim Jordan, but he wasn't able to join us. Um, OK, fantastic. And I think overall, I want to end on a positive note over here. You know, e-commerce is growing and 2020 has been a crazy year, but it's it's been a transformational year as well, I mean, especially for e-commerce. And um, you know, I think all of us are probably in the right industry at the right time. And, uh, um, you know, because of that, I think we have a lot to look forward to in 2021. And um, um, I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, hopefully positivity <laughs> that 2021 brings to us. So, yes, cheers to 2021. Goodbye, 2020. <laughs> 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 We're definitely right, in the so. right industry. <laughs> yes. Mikhaila says, thank you all for the wonderful tips and information. I really appreciate you. And thank you, Megla, for organizing this amazing summit. Yay. I received Yay. so much value from the speakers. Thank you. Oh, that is amazing. Thank you so much, Mikhaila. And I have a special gift for you, Mikhaila. So stick around, okay? Um Okay, awesome. So um, we're going to end this panel discussion now, but then Anthony, you're going to stay stick around because we're going to be giving some um, prizes to people. So Bernie and Sharon, thank you so much for your time today and wish you all the very best for 2021. Thank you, Megal. Hopefully I'll see you in Hong Kong next year. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Bye-bye. <laughs> you later, guys. Awesome. Take care. Bye. Okay, cool. So now comes the fun part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Woohoo! So first of all, what I want to do is we we've got a lot of uh, coupons that we want to give away, and we're we're giving away coupons for a um, hundred percent free PickFu campaign, and and each campaign costs about fifty dollars. So we've got about ten campaigns that we want to give away, and. Um, first of all, what I want to do is there are a few attendees of this summit who have been who have attended most of the sessions and they've been very participative and they've asked a lot of questions, engaged a lot. And some of them have been up at 3 a.m. in the morning and some of them have slept only for three hours and come back for the for the next session. So I want to give um, some of the attendees free coupons. And so first of all, I want to give a free coupon to two 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 <laughs> the one person who's who's probably attended almost every session Mikaela. so congratulations Mikaela. you get a free pick food campaign worth fifty dollars uh, and thank you so much for attending all of the sessions and for participating and being such a great sport okay number two goes to shahzad so shahzad is from pakistan he's a seller and uh, he's got a couple of different businesses and he's been up since 3 a.m <laughs> uh, for the last uh, i think yesterday and he's attended quite a few sessions as well so and he's also participated in a lot in a lot of the sessions so thank you so much shahzad for your contribution and participation you get a free pickfu poll worth fifty dollars Okay, and who's next on my list? Okay, next on my list is Payman. <laughs> Payman, you get a free coupon too. So thank you so much, Payman, again, for your encouraging words and um, for, again, participating in the, in, the, in the event and always contributing and also spreading the word about the summit, yeah. Um, Megla, you're the real MVP. <laughs> What's MVP? Most valuable player. Oh, okay. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Mikala says, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mikala. It was, it was really good having you. And, um, um, yeah, Ian says, well, Ian, you've won three coupons already earlier when we had the, when we had the contest. So, <laughs> um, 
Um, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Okay, so those were three coupons that I wanted to give away to some of the attendees. And now what we're going to do is we're going to ask you some questions. And the people who answer the question correctly, they are going to get a prize. And so you have to be fast. So the, the first person to answer the question correctly is going to get a prize. And these questions can be, uh, you know, are related to global sources or they are related to the summit. So let's go. Are you guys ready for the first question? Okay, so this question is about global sources. Let's see how many of you know this. And you can guess. If you don't know the exact answer, just guess and we'll see who, ha who's, who comes the closest. So in which year was global sources established? And I'm going to give you a hint. It was not recently. <laughs> global sources is, is quite an old company. And I'm not going to say more than that. <laughs> Let's see. Which year was Global Sources established? It doesn't have to be e the exact year. But try to guess and we'll see who comes the closest. Payment is saying pick food rocks. 2011, 2004. No. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Elton. 1971. Yes, that wow. is the correct <laughs> answer, Elton. Congratulations. Okay, we've got another one. Um, Caesar. Okay, Caesar gets one too. I'm going to write down your names. So Caesar and Elton. Caesar and Elton, you were the top two on my screen over here with the correct answer. So Caesar and Elton, congratulations. Each of you have won a free PicFu poll worth $50. Okay, next question. You guys ready? This is also about global sources. What is the full form of O2O? And this is sort of about global sources because this is one of global sources USPs and what really differentiates global sources from other companies. So what is the full form of O2O? Man, this is making me miss the live event. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I don't like that there's a delay. So, you know, there's like a almost a 10 second delay. So we have to wait for the answers and then suddenly <laughs> they well, all come okay. in. <laughs> Let's see, full form of O2O. Awkward silence. <laughs> okay, Michelle has got it. Online to offline. Online to offline. Yes, Michelle, that's correct. Online to offline. Ian, you've got it too, but you, you've already won too many coupons. I'm not giving you any more now. <laughs> um, okay, who's the second one who got it? Ash. Okay, awesome. So Michelle and Ash. Michelle and Ash, congratulations. You have won. You have each won a, a pick food poll worth $50. Okay, next question. How many how many have you given away already? <laughs> Anthony, stop me if I'm going overboard, huh? <laughs> no, I think we have 10, so. Okay. Next question. Um, this is also about global sources. In which city does global sources host its physical trade shows when there is no pandemic? <laughs> where, where does global sources host it, hosts its physical trade shows? And global sources has been hosting its shows in different countries in the world, but there is one key city where um, which is like headquarters for Global Sources exhibitions. Hong Kong, yes. Who said Hong Kong? Who was the first? Elton. Okay, Elton. You got another one. <laughs> Elton is a Global Sources fan. <laughs> okay, Elton and Caesar. Okay, last two questions, guys. Last two questions. Um... Okay, ready? When was the first in-person Global Sources summit, summit held? And you need to give me the month and the year because Global Sources Summit is held twice a year. I'm not going to say when, but you need to tell me when the very first summit was held. Tell me the month and the year. Anthony, do you know this? Probably do. <laughs> I don't know. I know the first year I went, but I don't know how long it's been going for. 
2015 payment? No, that's not correct. April 2015? No. October 2018? No. October 2015? No. Is it before 2015 or after? I don't know. I guess we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more than Chai saying October 2016? Uh, no. <laughs> so I guess people know that it's held in April and October, but just need to get the year Getting right. Getting closer. <laughs> Getting, Getting close, yes. Elton, you got it. Yes, April 2016. <laughs> okay, Elton is getting quite a few coupons here. And Elton is definitely a Global Sources fan. Oh, it's your guess, is it? <laughs> it's your guess. Yeah, but you're right. Good guess. Michelle says, no, that's Terry. Okay, but Elton got it first. Okay, last question, guys. Last question. Um, who is conducting the upcoming Global Sources China Sourcing Workshop? So we have a workshop coming up um, this Friday in Asia and uh, Thursday in the US. So it's Thursday, 12 p.m. Uh, Pacific time in, uh, in the US. And then it's uh, Friday, 4 a.m. here in Asia. So who is conducting the workshop? Who is the workshop conductor? And hint, hint, initials are SS. It's a good hint. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I think this was too easy. <laughs> <laughs> Ian has got it. Steven Selikoff. <laughs> what do you say? Should we give him one more? Anthony? You know, you usually <laughs> use like a couple pick foo tests anyway. So it's, it's yeah. kind of with the intended use. Ian will get a lot of good value. <laughs> Okay, Ian, congratulations. You've got another one. <laughs> Mordechai says, Stephen. No, that's close. Um, let's let others get it. Fair game to everybody. <laughs> Very gracious winner. Um, <laughs> yeah. Mikhaila says, Stephen Salikov. Um, what time did Mikhaila comment? Let's see. Is it this, around the same time? Uh, no, it was a few comments after uh, Ian said it. Okay, we're good, gonna give one to Ian. Okay, last question. This is the last question. <laughs> How many hours long is the upcoming Global Sources China Sourcing Workshop? <laughs> you see what I'm doing here? I'm promoting the workshop as well. <laughs> Very smart. Join the workshop. <laughs> How long is this workshop gonna be? It is an in-depth, intense, hands-on, interactive, engaging workshop by Steven Selikoff. How many hours long is it going to be? <laughs> Nine hours? No more than Chai. It's not. <laughs> That's going to be intense. Peter, you got it. Six hours. Yes. Peter, you're right. Six hours. Peter and Payman. Peter and Payman. Okay, awesome, Peter and Payman. Cool, that was a lot of fun. So guys, China Sourcing Workshop is coming up in a couple of days. Definitely consider joining it. This is an exclusive, never done before workshop. It's, it's conducted by Steven Selikoff, who's a sourcing veteran. He's been selling products since 2005, sourcing from China for a really long time, really, really very experienced. So here's what you need to do if you're not already signed up. Go to globalsources.com forward slash summit and use the code WIN2021 for 10% off six hour sourcing workshop and uh, definitely a lot of value. And the price is about $145 and you get a 10% off on that. And if you want to buy um, the, the recordings of the summit, you can do that as well. You can buy the replays of the summit if you haven't uh, already attended the summit and attend the live workshop as well. So Elton is already in. Yeah, we've got almost, uh, I think, 75 people for the workshop. So it's going to be intense. Great fun way to finish the session. <laughs> yeah, I love a good quiz. Thank you. Well, Ian, it's been your lucky day today. You won four prizes. So uh, you've earned more than the ticket price of a summit. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So um, lastly, before we go, what I want to do is thank our sponsors. And, uh, you know, first of all, of course, Anthony, thank you so much for sponsoring. And then we also have other sponsors, Seller App, 
AMZ One Step and Amazon Sellers Lawyer. Thank you so much for uh, partnering with us, for sponsoring us, for supporting us. And guys, our sponsors are offering you some uh, freebies that I think all of you should take advantage of. So first of all, we have Seller App. They are, oops, why is it ticking? Sorry. Um, there. Seller app is offering a 30 day free trial of their uh, platform and also a one hour consultation call. So go to this URL l.sellerapp.com forward slash GS and sign up for their 30 day free trial. And um, the next offer is from AMZ One Step. So they are uh, basically they uh, specialize in images and videography and photography. So they are offering one free image to everybody and this is not only for paid attendees this is for everybody watching this webinar so go ahead to uh, bit.ly forward slash free amz image to get your free image and also if you want to avail their services they also have a coupon code so you can use the code uh, global sources 15 to get 15 percent off in case you want to use their services so that is that um Let's see if there are any more comments here. Can you go back to seller app? Yes, absolutely. So here is the URL l.sellerapp.com forward slash GS. And um, yeah, all paid attendees, I am going to be sending you all of the slides. So um, you're going to um, you know, get access to all speakers slides and their contact information. And these offers are also going to be mentioned in the slides. So, um, and Megla, Anthony, I'll just, go for I'll it. just add in as well. Yeah, for PickFu, if anyone uses the code GSSV2020, then that'll get them 50% off of their first PickFu poll. Awesome. Well, thank you. So, GSV2020, if you use this code, you're going to get 50% off of your first PickFu poll. Awesome. 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 Um, okay. Thank you, Megla and Global Sources. You're most welcome. So remember, guys, um, you are, of course, you know, you've learned how to sell your products. You've learned how to market. You've learned PPC and so many different things. But where do you go to source your products? Global sources, <laughs> right? Don't forget, global sources is um, one of the oldest. It's the oldest B2B sourcing platform. And there are a lot of verified suppliers, high quality suppliers, a high percentage of manufacturers on global sources and it's also very amazon and e-commerce friendly so check out globalsources.com if you haven't gone to the website uh, search for your products there send inquiries to suppliers and also take advantage of global sources match which is um, a service that global sources offers to all buyers where you send in your in your requirements of what types of suppliers you're looking for and then global sources will um, actually uh, search for suppliers suitable uh, for you and then send you the, the the supplier details and you can contact them directly. Hi, I was going to be back here today for the workshop at 3 p.m., but it's on the 12th. I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Mikala, we I actually sent out an email to everyone today. So just check your inbox or your spam folder. You should have the email over there. Yes, yes. Looking forward to the workshop. Thanks, Megla, for this awesome summit. That I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you so much, Ash, because, uh, you know, this is a, this was a live summit and um, I was afraid there'll be technical issues and, you know, people wouldn't show up. And we had one issue with one speaker who was a bit late, but we, we kind of winged it and, <laughs> and managed it. But um, what did you guys think of this live format? I mean, you know, a lot of the other conferences are pre-recorded. The sessions are pre-recorded. They're on demand. So you don't have that pressure of, you know, waking up at 3 a.m. And, and joining the live session. So there are pros and cons. Um, but what did you guys think of uh, the, the overall format of the conference? I'm curious to know. Do you want to just uh, share your thoughts in the comments? Got the Zoom link invite. Yes, Elton, Elton. So the workshop will be held in Zoom and the invite has been sent out to everyone. And I also have to point out that it is a six hour workshop. However, Stephen has said it may go for longer <laughs> because he has a lot of content. <laughs> so yeah, just be prepared. <laughs> 
You did awesome keeping everything moving forward. Okay, that is good to know. That is good to know. I love the live format. It was great to get my questions answered. Fantastic, fantastic, yes. Great to have questions answered in real time, yes. It was great. Only issue was some of the talks started at 5 a.m. here. Yes, I think that's the only issue payment, and maybe we have to figure out a way to cater to different time zones. This is great that we can interact with the speakers. Good to know. Allows more of a personal touch and connection. Yes, yes. Well organized and beneficial, more engaging. Great to know. This is my first summit. The PDF itinerary flow was very clear. Okay. Yeah, I think some people thought that um, the, the PDF looked very confusing because there were different time zones mentioned and there were so many. So it's good to know that you thought it was well done. You've done a great job of pulling it all together and producing it on your own. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't tell you I've locked up my kid. <laughs> Um, it was great. Actually, couldn't attend all sessions due to the time zone, but I feel I got a good chunk of the summit. Yes, and Ash, all of the replays are, of course, available. And what we're going to do next week is also uh, just splice uh, or, or slice up all of the uh, live streams and send you guys individual videos of each presentation. And we're going to upload them to Vimeo. So you'll be able to download the videos later, save them on your computer. So, um, you know, you and, and you can watch whichever video you want by topic so you don't have to go through the entire five hour live stream to look for a specific video okay great effort thank you yeah and thanks to global sources for giving us this platform to you know to for supporting all all e-commerce and amazon sellers um and um yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pity that we haven't been able to do the physical summit, but this is the best that we could do. Um, how can we keep in touch with each other? It's nice to share thoughts in the future. Yeah, so Michelle, we are going to keep the Facebook group um, open. So we're not going to close the Facebook group. So feel free to interact with other attendees there. Some of the speakers have joined the group as well. Um, so I'm just going to keep the Facebook group open. And um, yeah, we can we can keep in touch over there. That's great. You will splice it up. That's very helpful. Yes, I think that'll, that'll be that'll be good for you guys. OK, awesome. OK, so I'm going to sign off over here. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, for participating. It was so much fun. I'm going to now sleep for two days because I haven't slept more than four hours in the last two days. But it was it was great. I myself have learned a lot and um, I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you all in the workshop. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye.